So here's J.J. Rousseau. Uh, you can see his years, 1712, 1778. Uh, I think it's fair to say the most influential thinker of the 18th century. I don't, I don't think there's really any doubt about it. Voltaire would be, let's say, maybe number two. So where does J.J. come from? Well, he's from Geneva, so he's not French. He is, of course, French-speaking because in Switzerland, as you know, the western parts of Switzerland are French-speaking, the eastern parts are German, and so Geneva is very, very Francophone, and so very Francophile, too, but it fortunately has borders that keeps the French out of the way, and so that's, uh, that's a unique place, a unique condition. Here's a little map of, of Switzerland. You can see Geneva is way down in that corner, that uh, way far west, southwest corner, just with a border of France all around it, north of the city, around the south side of the lake, etc. Here's the city in its beautiful little bay with vineyards all around it. Same city we talked about last week with Voltaire. Voltaire is living just a little way away. There's the city and the lake. And here we look up to the city and uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral up at the top, which of course was Calvin's home. That's where he preached. Geneva was Calvinistic. It was Calvinist Protestant when Rousseau was born. Here's the center of the city. And we were looking up there. There's the hill with the church on the top of it. And then the grand old palace hotel down by the front. And here's Old Geneva, the streets of Old Geneva, which is pedestrian only now, beautiful part of Geneva. And here is Rousseau's street, Grand Street, and here is his house. So right there with the plaque, you can see the plaque, is where he was born, Rue Grand and Geneva, to Susan Bernard from a very, very fancy upper-class Geneva family, and his father was from a very definitely not upper-class family. He was from a low-class family. He was a worker, a craftsman, a watchmaker, and the Bernards didn't like him and thought it was a terrible choice. And of course, you can imagine how many times the stiff-lipped Calvinist father told Susan that she was ruining her life by marrying this stupid idiot. Married him anyway, got pregnant, and produced little Jean-Jacques, June 28, 1712, in that house, number 40. It's a little museum now, of course, to remember. Geneva is quite proud of Rousseau, as they should be, and also of Voltaire. So downtown Geneva, there is J.J. born into this rich Geneva family. Uh, his mother died very quickly after his birth, got infected, happened so frequently, and died. And so suddenly the little boy was without a mother, and the family agreed to take care of him. His father went off to get a job, disappeared, and so his uncle now will take care of him for a number of years. Fancy family, all the resources in the world. So little JJ is beginning his life with a sense of being special and from a special family, having having uh, resources, and, and he always had a kind of sense of being important. Now, of course, most of his life he had no money, so it was hard for him to, uh, to convince everybody else how important he was, but he was quite sure that he was. His father goes off, looks for work, disappears, and then he came back. Then he suddenly came back and wanted his two sons. Jean-Jacques had a brother, an older brother, and so the two little boys went off with uh, Isaac Rousseau, who was a watchmaker. Now, when you consider that the great mythical idea of uh, the scientific age is that, that the world is a giant clock, right? Uh, it's kind of fun to think Rousseau's father is a clockmaker kind of wonderful to think that he was trained in making clocks, watches, and uh, didn't particularly like it, and goes off and rebels against the great uh, clockwork uh, universe. In any case, here he is now with a craftsman father who is not just an ordinary dumb craftsman father. He's a very interesting, complicated, independent man who leaves and disappears and comes back, so I'm sure there, there was a sense of uh, insecurity. But he was also, he was a reader. They had a lot of books. 
So Rousseau remembered every night after supper we read some part of a small collection of romances, this would be French language romances, which had been my mother's. My father's design was only to improve me in reading, and he thought these entertaining works were calculated to give me a fondness for it. But we soon found ourselves so interested in the adventures they contained that we alternately read whole nights together and could not bear to give over until at the conclusion of the volume, sometimes in the morning, on hearing the swallows at our window, my father, quite ashamed of his weakness, would cry, come, come, let us go to bed. I am more a child than thou art. His father was a, a workman and a craftsman, and of course, Rousseau was a little uncomfortable about that because he also had been in the upper class, so he had a kind of a sense of, uh-oh. Uh, but um, it wasn't a home without books, without ideas. As I say, it's kind of wonderful that his father is a watchmaker considering that his great rebellion will be a rebellion against the clockwork universe. The the idea of all these great scientists that you could figure out the universe once and for all, and once, it, once you did, all the pieces would fit in, and of course, as I said, God is in retirement, he's not gonna fool around, change anything, so everything will just work beautifully uh, once you know how it works. At 10, he went off to a country day school where they would go out of the city, it was thought to be good to have the kids go out in the country, and run by a young schoolmaster, um, Monsieur Lambertier, and his beautiful sister. The two of them ran this school, and of course the kids loved it because they had two young schoolmasters. And so J.J. Uh, loved it, loved it, loved the school. Nobody quite understood why. Uh, one of the reasons he loved it so much was he loved Mademoiselle Lambertier. And when he was bad, and he could be bad, uh, she would spank him, she would give him a whipping. And when you got a whipping in those days, you would take down your panties and you would whack those little naked buttocks. And as she gave him these spankings, he and she discovered quickly that he liked it. <laughs> now, here's the beginning of the introduction to the bizarre sexual history of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It's not normal like anybody else. It's, it's very unusual. It's filled with all kinds of repression and then the opposite of repression and romances with people, various people, uh, and almost never in his entire life does he have just a good old fashioned, simple, fall in love with somebody, marry them, stay with them, have a couple of kids, raise the kids. Never, that never happens. So once the director of the school, Monsieur Lambertier, realized that the spankings were actually a delight, little J.J. had to go home. That was, yeah, that was the end of that. <laughs> so in 1728, age 16, so he's going to a school in the city. He and a friend go out of the city for a hike. They come back and the gates to the city, this was normal, all these cities had gates from the Middle Ages. The gates were closed. So closed and locked. So that meant you couldn't get back in until the morning. So you're stuck outside. And so he decided, I, if I can't get in, I'll just, I'll just take a hike. I'll just take a hike. I'll just, I, don't, I don't like my life very much right now. I'm having to study engraving. He hated engraving. His father had sent him off to an apprentice to learn about engraving. He didn't want to do that. So he convinced the friend, let's go. And off they went. The friend falls away pretty quickly, but JJ just keeps on going. He just keeps on going, he never goes back. Well, he actually goes back a long time later. And he goes south from uh, Geneva into the independent uh, kingdom of Savoy. Savoy was one of the oldest small states in Europe. It went over the Alps from the French side to the Italian side, and the capital city of Savoy was Turin. And of course, Turin is still essentially the capital of the medieval dukedom of Savoy. So Savoy was independent, so he'd left Geneva, he'd left France, he was in Savoy, and he wandered and he wandered and he walked and he walked. Some kindly priest, one of the places that he came to was Annecy, which is a beautiful city south of Geneva in this little niche, which is now in France, but in then those days it was independent. And a nice priest, uh, he stopped at a church, asked for 
food, he was tired, he was hungry. And the priest said, well, uh, okay, but then, then he sent her him to the next day to the home of Baroness Louise de Waran. And Louise de Waran was a, separated from her husband, Baroness, in a Roman Catholic country. Uh, she was 29, she was beautiful, she was cultured, she was religious in the sense she was here specifically because she believed in the Roman Catholic Church. And so she uh, took in the wandering boy. The priest had sent the boy to her, and so she took him in. And so he moved in. And now she looks for various kinds of work for him. Uh, there's lots of different things they try. He didn't like most of it. He doesn't like working very much. <laughs> now, on his own, later in his life, he will find the things that he likes to do, and he'll find a way to make them pay the bills. But, but she found him different jobs. And one thing that he could do was copy music, and so he did that for a while and lived at her lovely home. And so he became part of the, of the home of the Baroness. And there were other people, there were servants, and there were uh, people arriving and going from the church. She was receiving a, a payment, a monthly payment, from the uh, Vatican because it was all part of their outreach to bring in Roman Catholics if they could since this whole part of Europe was sort of in the middle. Uh, Switzerland was Protestant and France was Roman Catholic. And so she had this uh, annuity. Her husband had given her some money when they separated, uh, but she's not ever going to be particularly rich. And later in her life, when Rousseau is very famous and very rich, well, not very rich, but very famous in Paris and certainly with lots of money, uh, she needs money and he is not very generous to her. He should have been. Life in Savoy, in the home of the Baroness. They moved to another beautiful city in Savoy, Chambéry. Chambéry, some of you know, it's in France now. And he is part of the, the menage in the household. Uh, he was still a very, very innocent boy, still a virgin in the household. And so he really didn't understand that the accountant by the name of Claude Anet. Here's Chambéry, beautiful city. Here's Monsieur Claude Anet. He didn't quite catch on in the beginning that Claude Anet was doing more than her accounts. But he, he was happy. He was very, very happy. He was madly in love with the Baroness. She was 29, he was 16. He was madly in love with her because, of course, it was all a dream. It was all a sort of a myth of, of, of life with her and life. Now, He's on his own, you know, he's completely on his own. He's left home, he's left his father, his mother is dead. The only brother he has he never sees again. And so here he is now, from this moment forward, he's on his own. No siblings, no parents, no money, nothing. The household move to Les Charmettes. I love this painting of Les Charmettes. You can guess what this uh, is. It's charming, as you could guess. Uh, the Baroness moves everybody out to Les Charmettes for a summer country idol, a beautiful country life out of the city for the summer. And everybody went, and including uh, Rousseau. And this is the paradise of his life. This is the dream life of his life. It will be the dream of perfection for the entire rest of his life. All the books he writes, all the ideas he ever publishes, they're all rooted here in Les Charmettes. Happily for us, it's all still there. It's all been preserved. And of course now, with all the publication of all the books about Rousseau and by Rousseau and his confessions and vast writings about the life here, People love to visit, so there's a very busy tourist business to Les Charmettes. If you're ever in Savoy on a summer trip in a car, you should stop. It's, it's fun to see. Here, finally, in 1733, his life is complete. The Baroness decides he's old enough to uh, lose his virginity, so she takes on the responsibility. Of course, uh, the accountant is still in the house, also taking care of her, so so she's a very busy woman and Rousseau falls in love with her. I mean, totally crazy in love. His novels that he will write for the rest of his life are all based on this moment in his life when he's in love with the Baroness, he's living in this beautiful country home surrounded by gorgeous gardens, a nature, 
uh, pure, wonderful herbs from the garden and wonderful tomatoes and lettuce that you're eating that are organic. Whole Foods will be proud of every one of those tomatoes. It's paradise. It's paradise. It's, it's nature, natural beauty, and they play music together, and they read poetry, and they read novels together, and this dream of Le Charmette will nourish all the rest of his philosophy, all his life, everything he writes, it's here. It's dirty civilization that wrecks everything. This is great life. This is what anybody would want. And he's right. I mean, all of us here would be glad to go to Le Charmet this summer and have no worries. All we have to do is go harvest our herbs and our tomatoes from the garden and make our salads, right? So there it is, Le Charmet. Now, of course, it couldn't last forever. Here's the dining. This is the actual, these are pictures of the actual house, and you can walk around and see it. But after an, uh, several years, so they would go back to the city, then they'd come out. So they came back to Le Charmet several, several summers. But all of a sudden, it changed a little bit. A new gentleman friend uh, arrived, <clears throat> moved into the house. Uh, his, his name was Monsieur Vincent Reed. He was from Germany. He was tall, handsome, well-built. Uh, Rousseau was not tall. And suddenly Rousseau was furious and jealous because it, it, it clicked that he was sharing the Baroness with Vincent Reed. And so in 1740, so he's, he's been here a long time, that is multiple years uh, working, different jobs that she helps him get, living in the menage at the house, enjoying it, uh, and, and, and madly in love with the Baroness. But the arrival of this particular so obvious boyfriend sours him on the life at Le Charmet. It's no, no longer charming. So he packs up and leaves. He goes to Lyon. And then finally, in 1742, he arrives in Paris. So he has a couple of jobs along the way. She helps him get a job in Lyon. Uh, and then finally, he ends up in Paris.